Welcome to How I Raised It, the podcast that goes behind the scenes with entrepreneurs who've raised capital. We uncover the tips, tricks, and techniques they use to get investors to write a check. Strap in and turn it up. Hi, welcome to another episode of How I Raised It. Today I have Nathan Hecht of Honker coming to us from New York. How's your day going, Nathan? Good, thank you. Thanks for having me. Yeah, thanks for doing this. So, first of all, I love the name Honker. It's like stuck in my head. It kind of, it's making me smile all morning here. Uh, what is Honker, and and why did you start this business? What do you guys do? Um, Honker is um, an app for consumers to lease a car in a few swipes. So essentially, we are giving consumers an option instead of going into a car dealership or going from dealership to dealership, shopping, choosing, putting in credit applications, negotiating, in a couple of swipes on an app, um, you can do that and have the car delivered the next day. um, Were you in car sales or were you in mobile apps? Like how did you come up with this? Were you buying a car and recognize the the problem? You know, where did this idea come from? So my background is is, um, definitely not in the car business. Um, I learned the hard way, as they say, as a consumer Uh um, about the car business. Um, I started out in uh, semiconductors and embedded software um, about 17, 18 years ago and uh, then moved to uh, software, uh, software as a service and eventually ended up uh, at Honker. But the business was born from a less than pleasant experience that I had in trying to lease a car, going into a car dealership. Um, I, all I wanted was a simple price. How much is that car per month? Um, and when can I get it? And it turned into this entire process of going into the store. And the, the dealer was like, yeah, you know, just, just come inside. I'll, I'll give you the price. And it starts with who are you? You fill out a credit app and then the negotiating continues. And that specific car is not available, but the one next to it is. And I spent a whole day at the dealership and eventually left actually without the car in mm-hmm. the late afternoon. And while I was sitting there, I was on my phone, um, as most American consumers, trying to do it online. And I realized that there was no way to do it online. There were similar things. There were a lot of almosts, but there was no, hey, I just want to lease this car and have it delivered. Um, and I came back home that evening, and I sort of huddled up with my, uh, my team, and I said, guys, we're going to build an app for car leasing. Because if I went through that, there's probably millions of other Americans that went through it. And that's how it was born. Yeah, no, my wife and I just bought a a, a new Highlander, and I, yes, it's it's amazing. This experience still is pretty broken. It wasn't as bad. I remember used to buying cars, you, you know, 10, 15 years ago. I felt like the dealers were much more aggressive, manipulative, a little slimy in some cases. I feel like it's improved, but still fairly broken. It's interesting. Sure, yeah. So... Uh, Go ahead, sorry. Well, so don't dealers must hate you then, right? I mean, where do you get the inventory, or or how do? Or no, you, a, mm-hmm. actually not, and that's um, and that's what I wanted to uh, to highlight for a second. Um, so we're essentially a marketplace. Um, we have the dealers on one side, and we have the consumers on the other, and obviously our technology in the middle. Um, and dealers don't hate us because dealers, everything that happens in the Honker app is controlled by the dealership. So dealers actually look at us um, as an extension of their rooftop, as is a traditional marketplace, an extension of the brick and mortar. Um, And they can control everything from where they want their cars to be shown, the pricing of their vehicles, um, how many of their vehicles they want to show at any given time. So there's a lot of awesome functionality that we give them. And, um, you know, when you give these tools to the dealership, they've actually proven to be very, very effective um, in, uh, in, you know, in clicking with it. it. And it works very well. That's interesting. Um, that, that's fascinating. So, um, uh, yeah, when we were buying this car, we were also selling our old car. And there's another company out there whose name escapes me right now that I thought was pretty interesting where they would pick up your car and then basically sell it online, but they'd be inventorying it and storing it, you know, off in some cheaper right. area. Um, just fascinating model, right. right? Kind of the other side of the equation. Um, sure. Very cool. So, um, 
let's start this off. How long have you guys been around? You're about two years old, three years old? Um, two years old um, since inception, um, since we started hacking at this. Um, the apps have been live on the App Store for just about a year. Mm -hmm. And obviously our first, uh, our first few months was a beta on, on Android, and then we released iOS. Um, and we started in one market in the New York tri-state area, and then we expanded to Southern California. And those are our two primary markets right now. And we have some new um, uh, test markets, if you will, that are very fast growing, actually, in uh, Miami, Philadelphia, um, parts of Nevada and Arizona as well. When you go into a new market, I, uh, probably classic chicken and the egg, do you need to sign on the dealers first to get the inventory and then you roll it out to consumers? Yes. Um, and, and we've been very, very lucky um, and blessed in the sense that most of the dealers that we have on the platform have actually come to us. Mm -hmm. So um, the first few dealers that we signed, um, you know, I went out and, and sat in the, in, the, uh, in the showroom floor waiting to you know, get somebody's attention and sort of pitched it and was lucky enough to move it up the chain you know, uh -huh. to the general managers or the vice presidents or you know, owner principals in some cases. And um, once they signed up, others heard about it and came to us. In the last few weeks and uh, prob probably about two months, um, we've started to build out a sales team um, and a biz dev team to start to reach out to dealership. And we're starting a, a marketing campaign for dealers to start to expand the network as well. Very exciting. How, uh, so how did you finance this originally? Did you uh, raise a friends and family or angel round or did you uh, bootstrap this to get going? Um, so I bootstrapped it um, on bootstrap and a combination of uh, some of my own capital. Mm -hmm. Um, and we went, uh, we went quite some time actually on, uh, in that, uh, in that way. Um, and then we did, um, a series seed. Um, we had like a mini friends and family just prior to that for a few hundred thousand dollars, but the more formal round was a series seed, uh, which was in August of 2017, uh, about six months ago, approximately. Mm -hmm. Um, and, uh, it was a, it, it was a, it was a, both of our funding rounds, our Series C and our Series A, um, were actually uh, uh, really, really good experiences from beginning to end. And if, if you'd like, we can get into that and how that worked and so on. I do, yeah. Let's start with the Series C. I, I had to look it up because it was driving me crazy. The company I was alluding to is called Shift. Carvana. Do you or know Shift. Shift, yeah. yeah. Kind of trying to reinvent the used car sales process, which I thought was interesting, their model. But anyway, um, a lot of disruption to this market. So, and one other little aside that I want to get into your seat. In college, I worked at a used car dealer called Reliable Motors in San Jose, California. And, uh, you know, some of the things we would do to, uh, to make these cars kind of, you know, look good long enough to get them off the lot was pretty funny. I probably shouldn't say too much so I don't right. myself. <laughs> so the, the, the one it's been, it is pretty funny actually and, and you know the adage the used car salesman but it's very um, important to highlight that we're doing new car leases only yeah, yeah. Um, and obviously the inventory comes from dealers so it's a you know it's a it's a it's a subset in of new car sales yeah 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 very good okay very good. Let's go to see uh, your series seed round. So, um, you know, how did you identify people interested in, in what you're doing? Did you keep it local to New York? Um, how did you start fundraising? So it's interesting because both our series seed and our series A, um, investors actually approached us in both instances. Um, so on our series seed, we were actually negotiating a term sheet um, with a different group of investors. And um, at the last moment, that, that term sheet didn't exactly work out. Um, and, you know, you go through the ups and downs and the emotional uh, uh, seesaw as, a, as an entrepreneur and a founder. And you think the world is coming to an end when, you know, when something like that happens. But within a matter of a week, um, uh, the the lead investor of our series C had reached out to me. It was literally cold. Um, he reached out to me on LinkedIn, and um, it eventually led to a phone call and a meeting and so on and so forth. And I, I was very quick to recognize that this was uh, a group that we wanted to you know to to engage with, and we moved quickly to a term sheet and to closing. 
um, probably within a matter of um, approximately six weeks. So uh, is that Lead Edge Capital? Is that your the lead? So, so Lead Edge um, was a was a uh, was an investor, um, but the the lead investor was Evolution. Evolution Capital Advisors, mm. um, uh, run by a gentleman by the name of Greg Smith, and um, together with Ev- uh, with uh, Evolution um, Collaborative Capital, which is a fund in New York, and Lead Edge um, uh, joined that round for the combined uh, for the combined Series Seed. So they reached out to you, or the investors approached you, which is always exciting, but. And that's, you know, great, right? But for the audience members saying, hey, no one's reaching out to me. What, where did they hear of you? Was, were they customers? Did you get some press in, in the New York media? Yeah. Right. <laughs> so um, it, it's a good question. And I, I can totally relate because this is my third startup. I can totally relate to, you know, the founders who are like, what you just mentioned, uh, you know, how does it, how do you ultimately get the attention of investors? Do you reach out to them? Do they reach out to you? Why are people ignoring me? Why am I getting so many rejections and so on? Um, I don't think there's a secret sauce per se. Um, I have a few ideas about it, um, but there are no absolutes. Um, but in our specific case, um, the 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 managing partner at Evolution. Um, in passing was past our investor deck, our presentation from the previous investor that we were um, talking to, negotiating with. And they just passed it on to him, uh, maybe maybe as a possibility of him joining the round or whatever. And uh, so that's how he was introduced to us. And he was intrigued. Um, and we spent some time together. Um, and they were looking specifically for you know something in auto, they also had some uh, so, some uh, interest in marketplaces and auto and so on, and then one thing led to the next to uh, you know to an to a, to a term sheet. Um, so that's how they got to us. I hadn't known or heard from them before. Interesting. Okay. And then how about the other two, Lead Edge and Collaborative? Did they reach out? Also, were they introduced from Evolution? Like, what was the? Um, so Evolution introduced us to Collaborative, mm-hmm. and it was actually a very interesting meeting um, at the. Um, at the collaborative presentation where I was presenting to collaborative the first time, one of the partners at lead edge, they have a relationship with lead edge happened to be there mm-hmm. and he was sitting at the table and I, I won't mention specifically which partner, but he's a fascinating guy <laughs> and, and he introduced himself. I didn't know who he was and he goes, all right, so like, what do you got? Like, what are you doing here? And I'm like, oh, you know, I'm pitching an auto um, auto tech startup. And he's like, all right, you know, show it to me. I got a family and I just leased the car. Yeah. And my presentation started. And he was like, are you serious? I mean, does that really work? He's like, pass me your phone. Show me your phone for a second. And I'm like, it really works. And he's like, two, three swipes and I can lease a car. He's like, oh, my God. I, you know, I, just, I just spent a week negotiating for my um, – for my minivan. And then he told me an interesting story actually about Larry Page and his minivan, hmm. uh, Larry Page from Google, which is a really cool story. And he was intrigued. Um, and he was like, you know, we, you, you don't exactly fit our criteria for, for a formal investment because we normally do later stage rounds, but he was totally blown away. The next day he like called us and said, you know, Hey, we'd like to participate with something. And you know, the rest is history. And yeah. we've had a great relationship with it since. So it was really a lot of fun. And sometimes these chance encounters, um, you know, they, 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 they turn into things. So I, I love that theory because it's, it's, I've done about 15 of these interviews and it's amazing how many times it is a chance encounter. I've had guys that it's the elevator right up with a certain angel investor, just the right elevator at the right time that, you know, led to a deal. <laughs> like it's pretty amazing. Right. Um, yeah. Cool. So, uh, let's see here. And you probably, it sounds like you probably don't want to go into it, but the the investor that didn't go in the round, did they like pull the term sheet away or, you know, (laughs) I don't know. Because these are sometimes the more interesting learnings is like, why did that thing go awry? What what happened there or any color? So they actually, they actually, uh, we executed a term sheet Mm -hmm. and, um, as we started to go through diligence and um, some other things around the details of the funding, um, we sort of mutually got a feeling that this wasn't the perfect fit for them and, and they weren't the perfect fit for us. And I was, I was very specific in, in um, the type of partner that we were looking for and the value add that they would bring. 
and 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 we had a very good working relationship, and we basically had told each other, listen, you know, we'll we'll sign, we'll execute this term sheet, and we'll put reasonable outs into the term sheet for both parties. If we're not comfortable, we'll sort of let each other know. And we had very good lines of communication and diligence had started. And about 10, maybe 10, 14 days into the process, we realized that the, the fit wasn't just exactly right. And we sort of agreed that they wouldn't do it. And, and you know, they, you know, sent us the formal letter and said, hey, you know, we, we, we're, we're going to terminate the term sheet. Um, but it was, it was, it, it, it was right. It was frustrating. And, you know, you go into your little cocoon after something like that happens. But I knew at the time that it was the right, that was the right decision on both sides. Yeah, that's interesting. Well, Anything in particular, just gut feel, like the just or personality, or I mean, I don't know, because this is interesting. Like, how do you know when it's the right fit? You've got someone dangling money in front of you as a founder. Like, it's really hard to trust gut, you know. <laughs> so some of it was gut, um, mm -hmm. and some of it was, um, you know, obvious. Is it was it was um, one of only a very select few, <coughs> pardon me, early stage tech investments that they had done. So they were sort of looking at us um, probably in the wrong light, mm -hmm. um, and they, th their expectations of what of, of um, overall growth for the company, or you know when do you get to break even, um, and you know the overall value proposition. I think they didn't look at it in the in the in the way that we had hoped a traditional early stage investor would look at it. Um, so if it didn't fit their model exactly right and it didn't fit our, um, model exactly right, uh, you know, there was a tiny bit of why are we pursuing this if we're going to try to, you know, fit this, this square into a, into a, into a circle and, you know, we just realized that it wasn't exactly right. So they were not the traditional early stage venture fund, um, or even early stage angel investors for that matter. So. Um, they were sort of giving it a shot. They had done a few, and we were looking for something a little bit out of the ordinary. But in the end, it just didn't work. Yeah, it makes a lot of sense. It, it, you can sometimes get that feeling based on the questions they're asking. Yeah, I totally understand. That's a good, good analogy of the square peg round hole. Um, so yeah. at this time, when you're doing the deal with Evolution and Collaborative and Lead Edge, what kind of market traction did you have? Did you have a pretty good beta going in New York or, or beyond that? We're already in Southern California. Where was the company? Yes. Um, so we had, we had a very good beta going on in New York and we already had some traction in California and traction for us meant uh, the chicken and the egg dealers on the platform and consumers leasing. Um, it's, I'll tell you something really interesting when we, um, when the app, the first version you know, 1.0 was ready to go. My CTO came over to my house uh, in New York for dinner and we sort of like looked at each other and we had just pushed the app to the app store a few hours earlier. And I looked at him and I said, Amir, you think anybody's going to lease a car online? <laughs> uh -huh. And he goes, he goes, no. <laughs> <laughs> and I like, I went into another room on the couch to like cry. Uh -huh. And then, cause we had given like, our heart and souls to the company. And the next morning we woke up and we had two leases. Yeah. And I was like, holy cow, how did these people even hear about us? So th w the second that happened and I saw a transaction, I immediately associated with, you know, the things that you read about somebody using your product right away. And I just, I had an association with, um, with that of, of previous founders telling their stories or tech startups, you know, on stage at, you know, disrupt or whatever, telling their stories. And I was like, holy cow, somebody discovered us. That's huge. Mm -hmm. um, and then we sort of went there. So it put us in right away from the minute we went live, almost like into a very comfortable position. We're like, okay, we know, we know we have something now. You know, where does it go from here? How much money do we need? How, how many iterations is this going to go through to, to, you know, spread across the country and go global? I have absolutely no idea. But I knew right away I was onto something. Um, and that was, that was very, very big. And that was our, that was the first turning point um, for us, mm -hmm. uh, it, you know, in this, in this journey that we've gone through. And then um, by the time we were approached for, for a, a capital infusion, a formal capital infusion, we already had a number of dealers on the platform. Consumers were already using it, albeit in very, very small numbers. And we're still at you know, moderately small numbers you know, for the overall size of the industry. We're just beginning. 
but it was enough for professionals to look at it and say, hey, wait a second, these guys are onto something. Very interesting. Um, <clears throat> hey, what was your pitch? What was the core part of your pitch? Because obviously big market, broken market that people hate. I'm sure that was a big part of it. Some some metrics, right? People are actually transacting on this. Um, I, I feel like people have tried to solve this issue for a while, though, in numerous different ways. Like, what's your sort of secret sauce in the pitch? <laughs> so I, I wish I had the secret sauce because as I'm sitting here and talking to you, I'm thinking to myself, my goodness, how I can relate to frustrated entrepreneurs and 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 founders who are just wishing that somebody can hand them the secret sauce. And I, I honestly don't have it. <laughs> but there's a few things that that go into it. First of all, there's a lot of trial by error. Um, you have to try this. Uh, you know, there are the lucky ones who hit it on the first go around. Um, you know, you have the Mark Zuckerbergs and the Evan Spiegels and, and, and the Drew Houston's and, you know, the, the, com- the companies and the names that we know. But for every one of those, there are tens of thousands that struggle every single day and they're brilliant and they're doing awesome things and they're r- true disruptors, but mm-hmm. things don't exactly click. And you have to keep working at whether it's the product, whether it's the team, whether it's the the space, um, you just have to stick with it. The first ingredient um, is 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 you know the, the 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 wherewithal to just keep going and to to push every single day. And I think actually those are the unique the the outliers, the guys who have the stamina to keep going because almost every you want to quit every single day. My brother said to me the other day. Uh, he read somewhere, I think it's attributed to Elon Musk, starting a company is like chewing glass. It's actually worse than chewing glass. <laughs> it's, it's, it's horrible. <laughs> it's horrible. So it's a combination of the stamina to keep pushing, timing needs to be right, um, the industry that you're in, the pitch, traction, and it's really all the stars being aligned in order to ultimately get to this point. Um, and, it, it, and it just it, – and, and time. And time. Um, so the pitch was very compelling. We, we're in an industry that's ripe for disruption. Um, it's still early days for auto tech. Uh, we're lucky enough that there's a lot of noise around it right now. So we yeah. sort of fit into this, to this, you know, if you're a portfolio looking for these sorts of investments, we fit into that. And then, um, you know, our pitch is a no brainer. It's a couple of sentences. Um, and when you can show a beautiful product and a little bit of traction and all those other things are in place and the team obviously the right people. Um, and that's an entirely different podcast. What does that mean? The mm-hmm. right people? Cause you'll, cause you'll go through quite a few as you evolve. Um, and hopefully then you, you ultimately end up here, but I don't think there's anything specific for, for each one. I think some might need a little more of one or a little less of the other. And some may say I did it without that. So yeah. it's a combination of all those things. You, you know, I like the, the stamina thing. Um, this is not your first startup. How many startups have you you done? Um, so I've had three companies prior to this. One that was very successful um, started it in about 2000 and exited in 2008. Mm. And then I've had two two um, startups since then before Honker. Uh, one was a virtual currency startup in 2008 2009. Mm. Yes, everybody laughed at me and thought I was crazy when I was when timing. I was pitching virtual currency. You, you did mention timing, timing as one is one of that, the things. Exactly, yeah. uh-huh. exactly. And I couldn't get the attention of anybody. People thought I was – they didn't even understand what I was talking about. So, you know, you're pitching a virtual currency in the wrong time. Yeah. You're not going to be able to raise money. Um, and then um, another company which was in uh, cybersecurity, self-destructing files, um, mm. and then Honker. So that's the last uh, 18 years of my life. What was the first startup? What 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 space was that in? Um, military and aerospace semiconductors. Oh wow! So we were taking, yeah, it was a it was a it was a real niche in semiconductors. We were taking uh, commercial components and sort of manipulating them for uh, extreme applications. And we had a and both in hardware and software. And we had a subsidiary of that company in um, digital signage and um, other LCD integration products. When LCD flat panel LCDs were just getting popular, two thousand five, two thousand six. Oh, wow. Okay, let's go back to fundraising. So uh, let's go back and uh, talk about your Series A now, which uh, is a fairly new, uh, recently announced, right? When did when did that get announced? Um, it got announced in the last few days. Uh, we closed uh, approximately a week ago or a week and a half ago. 
And for anyone, uh, this is, what is today, March, or I'm sorry, February uh, 27th, if anyone's watching this in the future. Uh, okay, so that's, that's exciting. And so tell me about raising that round. So was it purely just the story of, hey, we've proven this in a, a couple of markets, now it's time to really blow the doors out and scale? Or, you know, again, we're investors approaching you. What, what made you decide to go raise another round? Um, so again, yes, in this instance, well, we were getting prepped to raise a series A regardless based on the things that were happening in the company and our, our traction and, and the direction we were going in. Um, but actually in this instance, yes, we were approached by, uh, by, uh, a few different investors and including the investor that we closed with IAC. Um, and, um, we had specific um, criteria that we were looking for mm -hmm. in an investor. There were things that were very important to us, as important as obviously money is the most important thing. Knowing the amount of money that you need, um, your your runway, um, and your roadmap to get there. Uh, you know, i.e., projections and 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 stuff like that. Um, um, anchored in reality, but again, you know, showing uh, showing you know exponential growth. Um, and then the other things that were important to us um, that this uh, specific partner really fit a lot of the things that we were looking for. And some of the other investors we were talking to were actually also um, strategics, if you will. So we were looking for and we're lucky enough to ultimately close with a strategic investor. What were some of those criteria you're looking for when you made that list? Like this is almost a matrix. I just got a, I did one of these earlier t today with a guy and he literally made a 12 point matrix. And, and ranked investor. It was amazing what he did to to figure out his target list. But what did yours yeah. look like? So so we didn't get that sophisticated. Um, but there were a few high level things that we wanted. Um, we wanted investors that had consumers or access to consumers. Yep. Excuse me. We wanted investors that had invested in or had owned companies that had somehow had um, something similar or in the vertical that w we were in. Um, so marketplace, for example, was very important. One of the potential uh, types of investors that we were looking for. Um, we were looking for investors that can help us with vendors. And we were looking for investors that overall had very deep resources, whether it was financial resources to follow on, whether it was um, human resources, whether it was access, um, introduction, um, promotion, um, help with marketing and things like that. So our matrix wasn't as sophisticated to 17 points, but there were four or five or six uh, important highlights. And, uh, and we spent time weighing our options, you know, venture capital, you know, tier one, tier two venture capital funds versus strategic investors. What do each bring to the table? What should our, our expectations be? Where would our valuation be? Who would give us the fairest deal? What was important to them versus there were certain things that were very important to us. Um, so it was a very thoughtful process. Um, and I am thrilled with where we ended up. I don't think we could have ended up in a better place, um, in the overall structure of the deal and the value add, um, that, that, that came along with it. Yeah, no, that's, that's exciting. Uh, if you're not familiar with IAC, I think they're kind of famous for like excite back in the day, one of the early search engines or, don't they have a, several dating apps? I think Tinder, right? Today they're um, today they're famous for Tinder, but they're old school. I mean, they've been around. I remember them from early days of the web. Uh, yeah, yeah. Um, did you meet Barry Diller? <laughs> I did not actually. No. Although I, I would like to. We got, we got just just underneath him. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. Um, so okay, so but strategic investor uh, is that? Do you have any concern about you know there are some risks in taking strategic money like um, sometimes they're right of first refusal and an acquisition or exit or I mean any you know sure. concerns you had about taking a strategic money? So I can I cannot speak to the specifics of the transaction um, obviously, but what I will say is is that. Um, there are always concerns when you take fiduciary responsibility of in, of investment or investor capital. Um, everybody has to sort of negotiate or structure deals um, in a way that uh, that's appropriate for them. That's pretty much as far as I can go on the details of of this specific transaction. That's fine. How many um, you were talking about traditional VCs and 
and strategics. Do you, how many were in your funnel? How many people were you talking to for this Series A, would you say? Um, who we were seriously talking to? Less than six. Hmm. That we were in serious um, or close to serious discussions with. Um, but there were, you know, there was some other, uh, you know, things out there that we felt that we could pursue if we, if things didn't work out or, if, or that we wanted to. And I think you always have to have options. And I'll say that with every part of a startup, you have to have options, you have to have a plan B, you have to have backups, um, whether it's for vendors, whether it's for investors and so on and so forth, because everything is just so fickle. Yeah. Um, or at least to the best of your ability to have as much, uh, of that as possible. Very interesting. Um, and how did you get in touch with, with IAC or that you said they reached out to you or did you lean on your existing investors, the seed investors for intros? They, they, they reached, I did lean on our existing investors for intros and they were fantastic in helping make some intros. Um, and they're still investors in Honker and, and you know, we have a, we love them. They're f fantastic. Um, but, um, IAC, uh, reached out to us, you know, in the beginning it's like, Hey, wait a second. Like really IAC, you know, this uh, massive multi-billion dollar public company conglomerate spun off a hundred billion dollars in value over its life. Barry Diller icon, um, you know, big names, um, through the years, names that we use every day. People don't even associate with IAC, but we're born and bred in IAC. <laughs> um, so I was very hesitant in the beginning and I, 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 I almost didn't even follow up uh -huh. and there's a lot of interesting things that happened here. Uh, I don't even know why I did follow up in the beginning and I was pushing back and I was like, come on guys, you're not going to do a small investment and this is not for you. And you know, what's really going on here. And slowly we started, um, to realize that their, that their agenda actually was aligned. Um, and then we went quiet for a little bit and then we re-engaged, um, and different people at the organization. Um, and, uh, you know, we ultimately ended up here. Did you, the first ping from them, was it from a, a junior person? I, I, I know sometimes you, you no. get an invite or an email from a, an analyst or associate and it sounds pretty exciting like, oh, I've heard of, uh, this massive billion dollar fund, but it's kind of such a junior level invite that it's sort of a fishing thing and it throws you into little head spin. I don't know. Did, yeah didn't happen to you? No, you're, 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 you're actually bringing up a great point. So specifically with IAC, um, it was actually at the C, the C level, um, you know, the executive level that approached us. And that's what threw me off to begin with. I was like, why in the world is this specific person reaching out to us? Um, um, and I, so that's what happened there. But I, I would like to comment for a second on, um, on whether or not it's worthwhile and I, you know, following up with, you know, when an associate who has to sit and reach out to, you know, 15, 20 companies a week, I will say that as exhausting as it is, my recommendation is, is that you do follow up because in IAC's case, um, in the way that this sort of moved from the initial introduction into this potentially becoming a deal, at a certain point in time, I almost didn't pay attention and said, hey, wait a second, but now it sort of was like handed off to someone who's a little junior. This is probably not that serious. And I wasn't going to respond, and I did. Mm -hmm. and, it, and that ultimately turned into a deal. So you never know mm. who you're talking to, you know, what their decision-making abilities really are, regardless of title, and where things can go. So don't dismiss... <laughs> outreach yeah. when you get outreach it cannot hurt in an efficient way do the best you can but you should absolutely respond good um okay great so let's see just a couple more questions i'll let you get back to your business um you know where does this money take you are you seeing competitors chasing you now um do you envision having to raise round after round after round. I mean, you're, you're chasing a big market. So how are you thinking about fundraising strategy going forward? Sure. So um, we have a, a, a roadmap um, and, uh, you know, a pro forma of where we'd like to be over the next uh, 12 to 18 months. Um, and we hope to execute. We're working very, very hard to meet or exceed those numbers. Um, and uh, it is a very, very big market. I suspect that at, a, that at some point we will need, uh, you know, substantially additional capital. 
Um, but it's all in the execution. If you can, if you can, if you can execute, um, and you can get stuff done, um, then I think that the, the, ultimately the money will find you and the fundraising concerns, um, uh, you know, sort of start to dissipate. Uh, the trouble begins when you, when you're not executing or you're not executing to expectations or competitors are moving fast uh, past you too fast. Um, so we have a good check on where we are. Uh, we understand our, our position very well and our, 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 uh, our, co- our competition as well. Um, and hope, and hopefully, you know, we'll execute. Yeah. Um, great. So last question then, what piece of advice would you give your younger self if you were doing this all over again, uh, either just on the startup side or on the fundraising side? Like what do you wish you knew then <laughs> that you know now? Um, if it's just one piece of advice, um, I would say work on controlling your anxiety because mm-hmm. ultimately what's meant to be and how things are going to turn out are going to be that way regardless. So it's not worthwhile stressing over it as much as we naturally do when you go through this process of founding a company uh, all the way through, uh, you know, uh, all the way through the process. So if I, I wish I could go backwards and sort of submit <laughs> to the process uh-huh. versus allowing it to have the natural, the natural effect that it does. So control that a little bit because whatever's meant to be is going to be. And the results along the way, uh, you know, will fall into place as they need to. It's interesting. So it's yeah. a bit of an abstract perspective on it, but uh, it, that's my perspective. Do you do any, any uh, I don't know, yoga, meditation, anything to control the anxiety? Because that's hard. It's easier said than done, right, when you're in the middle of due diligence. So, <laughs> yeah. I would actually love to respond to that. And, you know, I'm not evangelical in any way. I'm, I'm Jewish, religious, Orthodox Jewish, actually, uh, which is very unique to the tech scene as well, except mm-hmm. when you move into Israel, you start to see some of that. Um, what is pretty unique to, um, to the tech scene um, but I prayed hmm. and I hmm. found myself, um, <laughs> praying in a, in a more unique way, um, than I normally would. Um, and a little more, put a little more effort into it and was, hmm. was a little, um, and a little more energy and more thoughtful about it. And I think that that actually had a, a, a big impact in number one, the ultimate success that we had. I absolutely attribute it to that. And also in the ability to go through it and uh, and um, and get and 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 cope while you're going through the process. Sure. So yeah. yes, no yoga, but some prayer. <laughs> but prayer, hey, that's uh, you know, uh, whatever works for for you. I think it's good. So yeah. great, this is awesome, fantastic. Any call to action? Uh, if they want to learn more, just uh, check out honker.com with a h o n c k e r. Correct. Yes, put, sir. Exactly. Honker.com or you can download the C is there. It's H O N C K E R.com. A ton of information about us. You can also download the app uh, for Android and iOS on Google Play and the Apple App Store and give us feedback. The most important thing is feedback, consumer feedback. Tell us what you like. Tell us what you don't like. We'd absolutely love to hear from you. Good. Any, any plug for what markets you'll be going in next or uh, leave that to suspense? Uh, we have to leave that to suspense for right now, but we are expanding in the markets that we're in, uh, uh, and Philadelphia and Miami are two markets that have just started for us over the last few months, so we're going to put a lot of energy into those markets. And then if you can imagine some of the other big cities in the country, you'll probably find us there pretty soon. Awesome. Well, thank you, Nathan. I appreciate it. And uh, next lease, I think our lease is up in, is it a 24-month or 36-month at least? I'm not sure, but the next lease, we're up for a renewal. We'll check it out. <laughs> Awesome. Thank you very much. I really appreciate it. Thanks for having me. Thank you. Bye. Okay, bye.